Hello, I'm John Hartledge. Welcome to my channel. Today, we're going to go to Europe, to one of the most storied wine production areas of the world, one of the areas I like to call the great, one of the great influencers. And the little secret about this wine, and wines like it, you will not find the grape name on the label. It's going to be fun. Let's chat wine. So here we go. Look at the label. The label says Bourgogne. Now that's French. What it really means is Burgundy. So there are two types of Burgundy. If the bottle is a red wine and it says Burgundy, then it has to be 100% Pinot Noir. If it's white and it says Burgundy or Bourgogne, then it has to be 100% Chardonnay. And this area of France, known as Burgundy France, uh, is one of the most storied areas of wine production in the world, certainly. And uh, the particular area where this winery is located is certainly one of the finest wine production areas of Burgundy. So I would say you could possibly make a case for this being the capital of Chardonnay and Pinot Noir in the world. And certainly the style and the character, the textures, everything about the Pinot Noirs and the Chardonnays from this area have influenced winemaking for decades and, uh, and winemaking all over the world. So Red Burgundy, uh, from a producer that is actually one of my favorite, uh, favorite producers, and Vincent Giardin, uh, is known uh, worldwide for um, not only the Chardonnays that they produce, but also the wines that they negotiant. So I've talked about this term negotiant or negotiator or purveyor or merchant uh, in past episodes uh, that we've filmed. And a negociant in France is literally someone who purveys uh, either finished wines or buys grapes and then makes the wine. And in this case, um, uh, Vincent Giardin was really well known for white wines and white wines that they were, they were actually growing their own grapes, making their own wine, but he also created an amazing negociant business uh, dealing with particularly the Pinot Noirs. Um, and some of the some of the best. But what's unique about this episode is that we're going to focus on the Pinot Noir, even though Vincent Giardin is most well known for the Chardonnays. And I have to say, based on where it's from and um, the ilk, if you will, of the wine, the price point is not too outlandish. I saw um, one New Jersey wine uh, wine store giving it away for around twenty one dollars, which is which is almost cost. It's a great value. Uh, but also some other states, D.C. and Florida, around anywhere from $28 to $29. So, so that's why you'll see there's a kind of a large range uh, price-wise. But I'm really looking forward to tasting it. So that uh, capsule is on there. It doesn't want to twist off, so we'll go to our knife. And like I say, I like to, I like to get the capsule totally off because I'm never sure uh, what the makeup is of there, and I don't want to get cut. So there is a little bit of... Uh, like a little bit of a, a schmutz on the bottle, like schmutz, like a little bit of um, uh, gauzy leftover of, of dried wine. Maybe there, and there's a little bit of wetness on the cork. Uh, not wetness, but, but old, old wine on the cork. So maybe there was a little bit of wine that snuck out, but also that can be, don't, don't be alarmed, because I did not find any mold or mildew inside that capsule. So there wasn't liquid, uh, liquid wine. It could have been at bottling when you when the uh, bottling machine uh, puts the cork onto the bottle. Now, obviously, the producer doesn't want a lot of wine spilling out because if you multiply that times thousands of bottles, uh, you do end up with a lot of waste. But that that can happen. But let's let's see. The cork is a little moist, but not not a bad thing. I'm already smelling some fresh smells, which is nice. And not a corky smell, which is also a good sign. So now we have, so I think we have a good cork. 
And uh, let's see if that'll wind it. 100% Pinot Noir, let's see. I'm hoping for some cherries. Overall, some good ratings that, I, that I've that i read about this wine. Uh, this particular wine, again, the Chardonnays are highly acclaimed. Uh, but the when you produce wine in this area of the world, it's hard to resist you know, producing some red too, and you want to offer red to your, to your loyal, loyal uh, customers. So, interestingly enough, we're filming here, and I actually have a bad bottle. It's. I was a little concerned because there was a little wine coming out, so we can actually make it a make it an interesting, you know, chat about wine. What I'm smelling is like, not just a mustiness, but like. A little bit of a sherry kind of effect and that happens because at some point in the shipping because I know this isn't normal for this wine some point in the shipping um, the uh, the the cork didn't get popped up but some of the wine definitely did come through that cork so whether there was a whether the bottle got too cold and everything shrank that cork shrank so then a little wine could sneak out whatever happened uh, the wine got oxidized, or actually was introduced to oxygen, and it smells a little like sherry. And that was the one concern I had. At first, I was encouraged that there wasn't any real mold or mildew. I see that there was wine on the inside of this capsule. So sometimes it's like I said, it just kind of squirts out a little bit, and there's a little, little on the top. But uh, no, um, I think there's there was a problem here. And I'm actually going to ask my crew to pause for a second because I happen to have another bottle that I opened and I'll see if that's fresher. Okay, so I have another bottle which I actually has been opened maybe about three or four days and it's very clean and I'm gonna take this off and take a, take a gander. And interesting enough, this cork has no, uh, no sneak up of moisture. You can tell the wine has not uh, graced any part of the cork above the above the level where the wine uh, was in uh, wine was in the in the actual bottle itself. So there's hope there. Let's see. Still has uh, a really nice bit of rusty color. That smells more like a more like a earthy earthy Pinot Noir. So. What's interesting about this producer, they uh, they use very little new oak. And what's typical of Pinot Noir is you, you punch the cap of, of the of Pinot Noir as the grapes are, are fermenting. You punch that down and you and you add more richness and more body and more fruit. They're not doing this. They're doing a very uh, hands-off approach to the winemaking, uh, making a softer Pinot, almost a Pinot that has that developed character the moment you open it up. Mm. Mm -mm. Mm. Oh, I'm going to have to say no. I'm wondering about this cork now. I can't believe they drank so much of this. I mean, the, my, my, the guests that, that had these bottles, I mean, they drank so much of this wine. Mm -mm. I mean, it seems like it's very fresh, but... This has never happened. I usually am usually just right on the money. Let's try breathing it a little bit. I'm just, wow. Yeah, maybe that, that tan or that uh, rusty color is no lie. Wow, this is 20, 2014. I'm baffled that this is uh, this dark and, and tart and just stinky. I mean, look. Thing about Pinot Noir, especially from France, um, especially Burgundy, a trot through the barn is what we would call it. Um, a trot through the barn is good. It's a little bit of earth, like you, 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 you know, trot through, you know, by the horse stalls. There's just that little aromatic of earth and and dung and and the farm. But if you slip and fall, there's a problem. <laughs> you don't want to slip and fall, and that means you're slipping on, you know. And certainly not cow. You don't want that. You don't want that kind of dung. And I hate to be so graphic, but it's just, it's real because you smell these smells. You think, oh my God, it smells like poop. But now that I, now that I actually uh, breathed it with the, um, 
Gave it a little breath with the aerator. Find your words, John. Hmm. Better. 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 But still, for me personally, it's not the fruit that I'm looking for. I'm looking for a little more cherry fruit. This has, you know, kind of a burnt cherry in the back, 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 background. I'm getting more of the acidity of the grape and more of that barnyardy kind of aromatic. I'd have to say, I'm gonna pass on the Cuvée Sam Salmon Song. I know that's not great for uh, for marketing and um, before we air this episode, I may try another bottle and, and splice in the tasting of, a, of another fresh bottle. But wow, I mean, that's... So something happened either in the shipping, um, either you know, post-production with this vintage. Um, I'm just not sure, but uh, I'm going to have to... I'm going to have to give it a pass. And I'm going to have to be honest. For me personally, um, uh, I've been tasting wine a long time, and I, I mean... The bottom line is, even if it may go well with something, I mean, put something really stinky with it. Put some kind of really earthy mushroom dish with it, you know. But it's still, you know, the better part of $25, $30. I have a hard time recommending that um, because just standing alone by itself, could I enjoy that on some level? If I'm stretching and I'm saying, hmm, it's interesting, it's just... Hmm. I hate, I, I feel bad. I mean, like, personally, I feel bad just because I don't want to waste my moments of wine appreciation on something that just doesn't deliver, especially if I'm going to pay $30. So, there it is. That's my truth. Mm. Mm. Listen, thanks so much for joining me for this episode. If you like <laughs> what we've been through, even though it wasn't the best wine, Hit that little subscribe button. Subscribe, sip, something else, and share. And don't forget to ding that bell because that'll give you a little notification when we put up a new wine. And please come back and let's find another one to try together. <laughs> Until then, let's chat wine.